around 1590, Toyotomi Hideyoshi had completed his quest of taking over Japan for the most part. Uh, he'd, ta he'd taken power, centralized power around himself, created a sort of polity in Japan that really had never been created before, at least at this level. And you'll notice in history there's sort of a pattern when a country is unified for the first time, or for the first time in a long time, and by unified of course we mean brutally subjugated and conquered, um, the, the martial energy of that country, which up to this point has been directed at itself, is then directed outward at some foreign country. That very often happens, and in the case of Japan, that's exactly what happened. Toyotomi Hideyoshi dreamed of conquering China. That was the big prize. China was the big prize. But he felt that in order to do so, he needed passage across Korea. That was essential. So he approached the Joseon government in Korea. At this point, the Joseon had been around a couple hundred years, uh, tight with the Chinese as far as they had to be in order to survive the Ming Chinese uh, uh, government. But otherwise, they liked to do things on their own, obviously, and flex their, their muscles of independence when they could. In any case, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi approaches the Koreans and asks for safe passage for his armies on their way to China, to conquer China, and the Joseon refused. And so Toyotomi Hideyoshi surprise attacked Korea with 160,000 troops. That's more troops than landed at Normandy on D-Day. 160,000 troops. This would have been the southern gate of Seoul uh, when the Japanese invaded. It had been built during the time of the first Joseon King and this was the, the southern gate of the city. It, there's a bell that rang up there at four in the morning to open the, the gates up to announce the opening of the city. Another bell rang at something like 10 o'clock at night to announce the closing of the gate for the night. This would have been the gate. Now the Japanese actually got into Seoul by basically getting through the walls, not through the gates. They, they found a floodgate or something and broke into it and were able to get into Seoul that way. But this would have been the gate and the Japanese held Seoul for a very long time. So Japanese troops would have marched in and out of this gate for years. When the Japanese arrived in Seoul, came to the royal palaces where I am. They found them abandoned. In fact, they found the whole city abandoned. Every shop, every house, and the royal palaces themselves had been abandoned. Some of the first to go had been the royal family and their entourages and whatnot. The king had fled, and this disgusted many Koreans. They couldn't believe that their king was abandoning them, basically leaving the capital city defenseless. He basically just locked the gates and left, or ordered the gates to be locked and left. So this humiliated many Koreans, many of whom actually joined the Japanese out of disgust for their own government's behavior. Others, of course, probably joining out of fear for their lives. But in any case, this was very bad for the Korean government, and the Japanese were able to push all the way up to Pyongyang and beyond, basically taking the whole peninsula. Now Ming China, which of course considered Korea its vassal, sent an army of about 40,000 men to relieve Korea. But the real game changer, in terms of uh, stopping the push of the Japanese invasion came in two parts. First, from the Korean people. See, the Korean people, as I mentioned before, had uh, actually, some of them had signed on with the Japanese out of frustration with their own government. Others were just too apathetic after being abandoned by their king. But uh, that all changed uh, when the true stripes of the Japanese army were revealed. And the Japanese like to keep count of their dead, sort of like keeping notches on a belt. But the way they did it, their notches came in the form of ears and noses cut off the bodies of those they killed. So a whole pile of bloody ears and noses, that'll change the local populace pretty quick into blood enemies. Add to the guerrilla warfare of these Korean peasants uh, and the harassment they were able to mete out on the Japanese army, add to that the Buddhist monasteries and their monk armies their harassments against the Japanese, and the Japanese were never quite able to exert real full control on the countryside that they'd supposedly conquered in the 1590s. The other great game changer came at sea in the form of a self-taught admiral named Yi Sun Shin. Now, admiral Yi should probably be one of the most famous military men in world history, but he's scarcely known outside of Korea and Japan in preparation for the Japanese invasions. I mean, he knew that the Japanese Navy would be numerically superior to that of Korea, so he had to improvise and 
what he came up with was, well, he, he knew that the Japanese favored uh, boarding ships. Now, they fired a lot of cannon too, but their, their favored method of naval attack was to board enemy ships. And so he built what we call turtle ships, possibly the world's first ironclads. Basically, what he did is he covered his ships in a metal roof that was spiked, made it very hard to board. In fact, sometimes the Koreans would cover the spikes in thatch or straw to disguise them so that boarders would impale themselves. Anyway, made it very difficult to board these, these turtle ships. They were very heavy, so they required many rowers. So you had 80, 100 rowers in each ship, maybe more. They also had a lot of firepower, and they came equipped with a dragon figurehead at the front. We're not quite sure what this figurehead could do, but according to the records, it could emit a poison gas. And if the wind was right, that gas could poison the air around enemy ships. It also could act supposedly as a flamethrower. You could also shoot through it. So very, very interesting innovations. And Admiral Yi was able to wreak havoc on the Japanese Navy using these turtle ships. Again, numerically very superior Japanese Navy. Drastically cutting off the supply lines, the Japanese army. Of course, any invading army, particularly one that's almost 200,000 strong. Supply lines, logistics, this is key. And Admiral Yi was able to devastate those supply lines. Still, the Japanese fought furiously in Korea. So even with the Ming Relief Army, even with their setbacks at sea, even with the guerrilla warfare going on, their goal at this point wasn't really to take over China anymore. Their goal was to fight their way into a position where they could exact concessions from Korea and China and make the war worth it. And they felt that they could do this. And really, they'd proven they could take over the Korean Peninsula and pose a serious threat to China. And so Toyotomi Hideyoshi, his goal at this point was, well, three things. He wanted a Ming princess as a wife. He wanted a Joseon prince and some officials as hostages. And he wanted a large slice of Southern Korea. And those were, he felt that he'd made enough of a statement to exact those concessions. And so the Japanese army left and negotiations began. Well, negotiations broke down. When Toyotomi Hideyoshi did not get the concessions that he wanted and the talks ended, uh, a second invasion was launched. He sent 140,000 more troops to Korea. And once again, the peninsula was ravaged. And once again, the Ming sent sort of a token relief force. Now things didn't go as well for the Koreans at sea this time around because Admiral Yi had been really fired. There was some politics going on behind the scenes. Uh, he was on the wrong side and he was removed from office for allegedly disobeying an order. But things were so bad that he was eventually restored to his place and immediately the Korean Navy began winning. In fact, Admiral Yi never lost a naval battle. He was in almost 30 and he never lost one. So pretty, pretty incredible record. He would die before the war was out. He was shot in battle and succumbed to that wound but not before, once again, wreaking havoc on the Japanese Navy and really turning the tide. That, combined with the death of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, convinced the Japanese to turn around and go home. Two invasions over seven years, possibly the most destructive war in Korean history, including the Korean War of the 20th century. Not just the Japanese, but the Chinese army had devastated the peninsula. Both had ravaged the peninsula multiple times. There was massive uh, loss of human life. Uh, not just from, you know, the fighting, but the destruction of farms and homes had led to famine, which led to disease on a catastrophic scale. And this was seriously devastating. Uh, the royal palace in Seoul had been mostly burned to the ground. Temples had been destroyed, homes, records. In fact, tens of thousands of books were burned during this period. Histories were burned. This is irreplaceable stuff. And this was really, really devastating. Uh, the Joseon was never as strong afterwards. The Japan-Korea animosity that runs strong into the present can be traced back to this event. But the war had a wider impact. The Imjin War had weakened the Toyotomi clan back in Japan, paving the way for the dominance of the Tokugawa with all of its implications for the next 250 years of Japanese history. Meanwhile, the Japanese army, which had destroyed the Ming garrisons in Northern Korea, left that power vacuum 
to be filled by the Manchus in that area. Of course, a few decades later, the Manchus would go on to conquer China and bring down the Ming themselves and conquer China and rule it into the 20th century. So these are some major consequences of the Imjin War. And unfortunately for the Koreans, the Japanese weren't quite done at trying to conquer and rule the Korean Peninsula. But that's a 20th century story.